May the Lord give you his peace. Today's Franciscan saint of the day is Serpent of God, Robert, King of Naples, Confessor, Third Order. Today's reading is from the Pavarello's Roundtable by Sister Mary Aquina, Barth, OSF, published 1939, by the Sisters of Mary Immaculate, Juliet, Illinois. January 17th, the Servant of God, Robert, King of Naples, Confessor, Third Order. Robert was the younger brother of Bishop St. Louis of Anjou and the son of King Charles II of Naples. When his father was taken captive in a war with the King of Aragon, Robert and his brothers, Louis and Raymond, were sent to Spain as hostages for their father, and as such were compelled to remain six years in Barcelona. While there, the princes received an excellent education in piety and learning from three learned Franciscans. Robert fostered in an special manner a great devotion toward the blessed sacrament of the altar. Upon the death of his father, Robert ascended the throne of the kingdoms of Naples and of Sicily. Since his brother Louis, who was first in line for the honor, had consecrated himself to God in the ranks of the clergy. However, even as a king, Robert per persevered in his pious disposition and publicly manifested his lively faith. With his equally devout wife, Sancha, he manifested a special love for the children of St. Francis, whose third order both had joined. At Naples, they built a convent for the Franciscan friars and another for the poor clares. When the affairs of government had been attended to for the time being, the king counted it as his most pleasant relaxation to go to the convent of the Friars Minor and to take part in all the exercises there. Not infrequently, he even took part in the recitation of the divine office at midnight. In the year 1335, he was anxious to resign the government and enter the Franciscan order. But insurmountable obstacles placed themselves in his way. He did, however, furnish a chapel in his palace together with living accommodations for twelve Franciscan priests, in whose midst he thereafter spent all the time that he could spare for state from state affairs. He himself lived among them like a religious. When Robert became ill and felt his end draw nigh, he put all the affairs of his kingdom in order and forbade the court officials to mention temporal matters to him again. Thereupon he begged for and received the habit of the Friars Minor, in which a week later, in the year 1343, he gave up his soul while absorbed in quiet prayer. In accord with his wishes, he was buried in the religious garb, without any pomp, in the church of the poor Clares, which he had and his wife had built, on practical faith. Consider that faith, which we must acknowledge as the indispensable foundation of the Christian life, does not of itself lead to salvation, but only when good works are built upon this foundation and manifests itself through them as a practical faith. Christ himself testifies, Not every one that saith to me, Lord, Lord, that is, not he who testif that, uh, that is, he not who just professes his faith in me, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth the will of my Father who is in heaven, he shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. How practical was the faith manifested in the life of the servant of God, Robert. Although he was king over rich and beautiful countries, he did not give himself up to sensual gratification and did not seek pleasure in vain pomp. Rather, he attended conscientiously to the affairs of state and then found his pleasure and relaxation in the divine services celebrated by lowly religious. That was indeed practical faith in that fundamental truth of Christianity. That man is not upon this earth for the purpose of enjoying material things, but rather to serve God and to find his pleasure in him. In what manner have you manifested that your faith in these or other truths is practical? Or has your faith been dead? If so, you have much to fear. In order to keep our faith alive, we should frequently, especially after spiritual reading, or at the conclusion of a sermon and similar exercises, compare our life with the truths of the faith that have been expounded to us. If our conduct is not in conformity with these truths, we must at once begin to amend. Otherwise, our faith will itself be witness against us at the judgment. And the heathens and the infidels will fare far better than we who are well-instructed Christians. 
Oh, that their life was, says Thomas Kempis, have been in keeping with their learning. When the day of judgment cometh, it will not be asked of us what fond discourses we have made, but how religiously we have lived. Prayer of the Church. Grant, we beseech thee, O Lord, to all Christian people to acknowledge in deeds what that they profess in faith, and to love the heavenly gift which they frequent through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he show his face to you and have mercy upon you. May he turn his countenance toward you and give you his peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pax et bonum.